grace. 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 And uh, we're still reading some of the Psalms of, of the Sons of Korah. Uh, this particular translation will sometimes say by the Korites rather than the Sons of Korah. Um, both are technically accurate, but um, I like Sons of Korah because of the fact that it eliminates Korah. So, <laughs> but, uh, so Psalm 45, starting in verse 1, it says, For the music director, according to the tune of lilies by the Kohathites, a well-written poem, a love song. My heart is stirred by a beautiful song. I say I have composed this special song for the king. My tongue is, is as skilled as the stylus of an experienced scribe. You are the most handsome of all men. You speak in an impressive and fitting manner. For this reason, God grants you continual blessings. Now, a lot of translations will use different words there to describe the manner of speech. I, I chose the translation I did because impressive and fitting are really more in keeping with the original Hebrew. Meaning, in other words, when this king speaks, he's, uh, he's, the words that he chooses are, are well suited to the situation uh, and doesn't mince with words, doesn't add too many words, addresses things as they ought to be addressed, and is eloquent when he does it. Okay, and so and I think this, the translation I just read conveys the meaning of that. So, you are most handsome of all men. You speak in an impressive and fitting manner. For this reason, God grants you continual blessing. And I can see again, I think that also would fit better than just because if someone spoke graciously or something like that. Because you can you can be uh, gracious in the way that you communicate and it not be something God can bless. Because in the middle of a lot of graciousness is lies. We just say things to fill an empty space and to make few people feel good and to uh, roll out red carpets into smooth waters that are meaningless words that don't, aren't really rooted in the truth. And uh, and so God would not wind up uh, uh, supporting that in any way. And so therefore, I believe that uh, it really is accurate to use this translation that it is, uh, his words are, uh, what, what was the wording again? Uh, his words are impressive and fitting. And it's for that reason, God grants you continual blessing. When a king, which this is written, composed to, very likely a natural king, but obviously it has uh, a very clear um, uh, way it depicts Jesus as well. Um, if a, when a king appears before other kings, or even before their own people, it's important that they carry themselves with an air of distinction. Uh, that what that, that they don't talk like just anyone. Uh, they don't use base humor. They don't use which really nobody should use. They don't use base language. They they speak with with an air of not arrogance but just uh they address things like they ought to address them they they are a a clear and accurate spokesman but what they say is also got to be fitting to what's being addressed and when you do that god can bless that but a uh, but a um a king that gets up and just uh you know acts the fool or tries to relate to the common man by reducing his language down to that of the gutter, then God cannot bless that. Okay, so this, that's really what's in keeping with what's being said here. So you're again, you are most handsome of, of men. You speak in an impressive and fitting manner. For this reason, God grants you continual blessing. Strap your sword to your thigh, a warrior. Appear in your majestic, majestic splendor. Appear in your majesty and be victorious. Ride forth for the sake of what is right on behalf of justice. And that's another very important thing. God blesses that if your cause is just, right? If you just make war just to make war, that's not something that's honorable. But if your cause is just, if what you're doing is for the right sake, then God can bless that. And the people can stand behind that. It says, then your right hand will accomplish mighty acts. Verse five, your arrows are sharp and penetrate the hearts of king of the king's enemies. Nations fall at your feet. Your throne, O God, is permanent. The scepter of your king is a scepter of justice. So now you can tell a tone changes here. 
It seems very clear in the first five verses he could easily be speaking to a natural king. Now, all of a sudden, when you get to verse six, he's elevating the poem, elevating the song to focus on God as king. He says, your throne, O God, is permanent. Are you seeing the transition there? The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, for this reason, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy, elevating you above your companions. Now, the way in which the writer understood what he was writing there in verse 6 and 7 is very likely um, he was blending the king with God himself, meaning God's throne is, in fact, forever. But when it says, for this reason, God, even your God, because the word God, you need to know in the Hebrew, can, if it's just the prefix el, it can refer to the Almighty God. It could refer to nobles or majesties or kings or lords. It could refer to any number of things. And so, uh, uh, but predominantly, Almighty God. So here, probably, the sons of Korah were thinking, um, you love justice and hate hate evil for this reason almighty god uh, almighty god your god uh, or 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 he would have been saying this reason for this reason o king your god has anointed you with the oil of gladness elevating you above your companions you see how the words are used that way now prophetically speaking this is specifically speaking about jesus and we know that we don't have to question it because it's quoted word for word in the New Testament, and we'll look at that in a moment. Verse 8, it says, All of your garments are perfumed with myrrh, aloes, and cassia. From the luxurious palaces comes the music of stringed instruments that makes you happy. Princesses are among your honored women. Your bride stands at your right hand wearing jewelry made with the gold of Ophir. Listen, O princess, observe and pay attention. Forget your homeland and your family. Then the king will be attracted to your beauty. After all, he is your master. Submit to him. Now, in verse 10, this is really, really good because it, it, it definitely applies. It draws us in as because because this is spe speaking prophetically about the Lord Jesus as king and Lord, then the bride would be prophetically speaking about you and I as the body of Christ. And so we have instruction here of what we ought to do. And one of the things we're told to do here is what women were to do when their land was conquered. Um, they were given, a, in Israel, they were given a time of mourning. If uh, if you conquered land and, and you were to uh, kill someone and that person happened to be someone's husband, then you took that woman into your home, but you did not take her into your bed right away. You gave her a time of grieving and a time of mourning and a time of, of, of mourning the loss of her homeland and of her husband and so on. And But then after that, and this was all by the dictate of God, God required that time of mourning and it was appropriate and, and right. But after that, you were supposed to forget your family, forget the kingdom you came from and submit yourself to your new master. And that is the way, or the way of things. And God's telling us, now that you've come to the kingdom of God, you forget who you were married to before because those days are over. Hello? You forget where you came from. You forget your former kingdom. You forget who your former husband because you're married unto the Lord. And he, he says here, then the king will be attracted to your beauty. After all, he is your master. Therefore, submit to him. Verse 12, rich people from Tyre will seek your favor by bringing a gift. The princesses look absolutely magnificent, decked out in pearls and clothed with um, brocade, uh, trimmed with gold. In embroidered robes, she is escorted to the king. Her attendants, the maidens of honor who follow her, are led before, are, are led before you. They are bubbling with joy as they walk in procession and enter the royal palace. Your sons will carry on the dynasty of your ancestors. You will make the pr them princes throughout the land. I will proclaim your greatness throughout the coming years. Then the nations will praise you forever. Now, this psalm, more strikingly than most, I think, dances back and forth, as I've already illustrated to you, between the natural and the spiritual, the immediate and the prophetic. Um, there's little doubt 
that this song was a love song and was written in the style of, or perhaps even to the tune of a pre-existing song called Lilies. It says so at the very beginning. The king in question could be an idealistic king, a metaphorical king, or it could be literal. Um, I would not. It would not be hard to imagine this being being little, uh, being literal, because uh, the time period that all these that book two is written in would have included kings like Solomon, Hezekiah, and Josiah, all of them very godly kings for the most part. Uh, Hezekiah and Solomon deterred off to the right. You know, pretty, it took a pretty hard right at one point in their in their their administrations, but nonetheless, all in all, pretty good kings. Okay. Um, and uh, so they had they were they were largely godly and had good stretches in their reign where they were honorable okay and so therefore this song could easily fit either any one of those men Solomon Hezekiah or Josiah at different points in their reign and it would definitely line up with the time period of the sons of Korah writing music okay however given the description of skilled speech I think this leans more towards Solomon than all three than the other two um, Hezekiah doesn't strike me as a particularly eloquent man, and Josiah was very, very young when he ascended to the throne. That doesn't mean he could not have been eloquent, um, but I think he was more of a, a matter of fact, get things done kind of a guy. Josiah was a great king. By, In fact, I would say he rivals David. He was a great king. He loved the Lord. He pursued him hard. Um, I mean, some of the things he did at the very beginning of his administration and carried all the way through his administration were a real pace setter for other kings. Just a great guy. But we don't know very much of the development of his, of his decorum and the way he carried himself, the way he worded things, but we know Solomon was a, a wise man, wasn't he? Without question. And so very likely, if it does fit a natural king, out of the three, I would personally pick King Solomon. Not that that's too terribly important, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. Now, after the initial introduction, Korah's sons begin to speak prophetically still of another king, and now um, of the king, our Lord, and Christ Jesus himself. We know this not because such words could have not fit anyone but the, uh, um, uh, any of the other the kings of Judah um, in this time period at certain points in their reign, but because this portion of the psalm is quoted in the New Testament book of Hebrews as relating to Jesus specifically. And so I want us to go ahead and turn there and look at it. It's in Hebrews chapter 1, and uh, we're just reading the, we're going to read the first 14 verses, but particularly uh, this reference, this direct quote is lifted, that's lifted from this psalm is found in verses 8 and 9. So Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 1, says, After God spoke long ago in various portions and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days he has spoken to us in a son. Now, later on it's going to talk about the son, but a son is literal here, okay? Meaning a son of his, God. Yes, uh-huh. King James says his son. His son, yeah, okay? Um, which would have to carry the same basic meaning, but us sons more literal. Okay, and it's uh, because God is the the uh, the the clear subject at the moment. It would clearly be His Son, but it's talking about a Son of God, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the world. Well, that limits all of God's sons down to one son, right? Uh, you know, all of us are children of God, and if you're trying to be gender specific, then I'm a son of God, but I'm surely not the one that he used to make the world, right? So we only have one son that fits that profile. That's Jesus. Amen. The son is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. And so when he had accomplished cleansing for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thus he, talking about Jesus, became so far better than the angels as he, in, as, I'm sorry, as he has inherited a name superior to theirs. Now, of course, from, for a lot of Christians, they're thinking, well, Jesus didn't have to inherit anything. I mean, he's God. Well, you need to understand, once he became Jesus, he also became human. And when he became human, he became a little lower than the angels for a time period. Right? Amen? 
But now it says, thus he became so much better than the angels, even as a human, right? As that he inherited a name superior to theirs. For which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son today, I have fathered you. And in another place, he says, I will be his father and he will be my son. But when, but, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And he says of the angels, he makes his angels winds or spirits and administers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever. So we know now this is the part that's quoting directly from where we just read, right, in that psalm. And we know very clearly the writer of Hebrews is saying the one being addressed right now when it says your throne, O God, is not talking about a king specifically like it was referenced in the Old Testament, but to Jesus as both king of the kingdom and himself God as well, right? Yes or no, okay? So he says, your throne, Jesus, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is a scepter of your kingdom. Now, this was a, this is a great verse, by the way, to use with a Jehovah's Witness. In fact, I did this years ago. I don't know if they've changed their translation, their New World translation, but at the time, um, uh, way back when we, Tara and I lived in, in a, a duplex, we had Jehovah's Witness come knock on the door, and I went outside and got some chairs and talked to them, spent some time with them, and this one guy, I think his name was Matthew, sticks in my mind, um, he came back a few other times. The first time he came with his grand poobah, the guy above him. And the next time he came, so they, they train people and send them out like that. The next time he came on his own and we talked for an extended period of time. From that point on, we just exchanged phone numbers and talked. And uh, we talked probably two or three times, probably just twice. Uh, and, but at one point we were bearing down on Jesus as being part of the Godhead, which is something they don't believe. They believe Jesus was a created being and uh, that there is one God, meaning only one entity in that makes up God. And I said, you know, well, I, I don't know what you're, well, actually I did. No, I, I, that's not true because I allowed them to give me one of their new land, new world translations. And I did that so I could have an intelligent conversation with the guy, you know, and I had before this conversation looked up this passage in Hebrews to see how do they deal with God the Father calling Jesus God. And in their translation, it reads just like ours, or it did um, 20 years ago. I don't know how it reads now. Um, but uh, so I asked him, I said, read this to me. And because, you know, I, we started at the very beginning and, it, and I made him identify who this son is. And he had no problem. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And he's right. That was talking about Jesus. I said, so now in verse eight, it says, but of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever. Why is God calling the Son God? Well, he didn't have an answer for that. And I said, you know, your Bible agrees with me. <laughs> doesn't agree with your, your Jehovah's doctrine, your Jeho Jehovah's Witness doctrine, but it does agree with the idea that God, that Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead. And it says it right here. And it's, it gets even more clear in a minute in verse 9. But it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you um, above your companions with the oil of rejoicing or the oil of gladness. So you're having two different gods here, right? You got Jesus being referred to as God. But in this special relationship, he says, even Jesus, even your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions because Jesus is also human, isn't he? Yes. He's, he's God, but as a human, he recognizes the father as his God. So that's, that's the reason for the unique language here. He says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness. In your humanity, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, even your God, the Father, has anointed you over your companions with the oil of rejoicing. So it's a beautiful passage, and it clearly is pointing directly to Jesus. But the sons of Korah were originally writing this, um, very likely probably thinking about Solomon, okay? And that therefore, 
our, uh, he would say, your throne, O king, is forever and ever, and the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hid lawlessness. Therefore, king, your God has anointed you above your companions with the oil of rejoicing. That's the way it would have probably read to a person in Hebrew so many years ago. But under the new covenant, this was brought into Hebrews uh, for chapter 1 by inspiration. And we know for a fact that that passage right there was prophetically talking about Jesus in his humanity and how he, as a human, rules in the kingdom of God, but he himself also is God. Is everybody with me? Yes? So it's a very, very profound and solid scriptural doctrine here. Okay, so that's a, it's a good thing to know to have your backpack. Okay, go on to verse 10. It says, And you founded the earth in the beginning... Lord, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Still talking about Jesus. They will perish, but you will continue. They will all grow old like a garment, and like a robe you will fold them up, and like a garment they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will never run out. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits set forth to serve those who will inherit salvation? So without question, this psalm is prophetically foreshadowing Jesus and the bride, his church. As uh, as we uh, as such, we find some instruction, like I said, in verses 9 through 11. Your bride stands at your right hand, wearing jewelry made from the uh, with the gold of Ophir. Listen, you princess, observe and pay attention body of Christ, right? For your homeland, forget your homeland and your former family. Then the king will be attracted to your beauty. After all, he is your master, therefore submit to him. This call to forget where we came from and invest our interest and devotion to our husband and king sounds very much like two passages in the New Testament. The first of which is at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. And the other one is in Hebrews 11. But we're going to start with the one in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. And it says this. It says, And what mutual agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said, I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among their midst and be ye separate, or forget the land you came from. Right? And be separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you. Kind of like the passage just said, he says, if you do this, then the king will be attracted to your beauty. If you'll forsake where you came from, right? So he says, therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the all-powerful Lord. The other passage that this reminds me of is found in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 13, reading through verse 16. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. These, this is of course talking about all of our patriarchs, and a, a, even a matriarch is brought up in there with, uh, with Sarah. It says, these all died in faith without receiving the things promised, but they saw them at a distance and welcomed them and acknowledged that they were strangers and foreigners in earth. So their heart wasn't clinging to this land. Amen? Are you seeing the connection? He says, for those who speak in such a way, make it very clear that they are seeking a new homeland. In fact, they had been thinking of that land. I'm sorry, in fact, if they had been thinking of the land that they had just left, they would have been given an opportunity to return to it. But as it is, they aspire to a better land that is a heavenly one. And it is for this reason that God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful, right? And so in, in, in my mind, that is very much connected with the psalm we just read. God will find, uh, will, um, uh, what was the wording again? It says, uh, then the king will be attracted by your beauty. After all, he is your master. Submit to him. So now the psalm ends in a procession that sounds as if it's describing our homecoming, escorted, as you, if, if you will, by angels. It says, the princesses look absolutely magnificent, decked out in pearls and clothed um, in a brocade trimmed with gold. Embroidered robes, she is escorted to the king, 
her attendants, which would be the angels. Didn't we just read that in Hebrews first chapter? It says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to attend to those who are inheritors of salvation? So it says her attendants, the maidens of honor who follow her are led before you. They are bubbling with joy as they walk in procession and enter the royal palace, which is exactly the way it's going to be at our homecoming. The joy, the, the angels are going to rejoice at our homecoming, right? Because the Lord Jesus Christ has received his bride. Amen. So he says, I will proclaim your greatness through the coming years and the nations will praise you forever. So whether by intention or by mysterious inspiration, the sons of Korah here composed a song about Jesus and his bride. So uh, I, I think that's a, a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now we're moving on to Psalm 46. Psalm 46, starting in verse 1. It says, For the choir director, a song of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth. I don't have the first idea what that means, so I'm not even going to take a stab at it. Um, now, God is our refuge and strength. I think we sang that sometime recently ago, didn't we? Our God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake at, with its turmoil, Think about this. There is a river, its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. Now, notice again a transition. He says, There is a river, its streams delight the city of God. This is such this is such a foreshadowing. It's amazing to me how we've missed it. He says, The streams delight the city of God the holy dwelling place of the Most High, God is within her. Where does God dwell? Huh? Within us. We are the city. There is a river. Its streams delight the city of God. I've never met a city that was delighted or depressed about anything. It doesn't have emotions. It's a plot of dirt. We are the city of God. We are being, as the New Testament writers would say, we are being prepared as a habitation for God in the Spirit. What do we see in the book of Revelation when it says, when John was brought, he says, come with me and I will show you the bride. And he says, and he, he pointed out and he said, look, and he said, I saw the city descending from heaven like a bride made ready for her bridegroom. The city that's described four square with the gates and all that and the, the jewels for their foundation, that's all a metaphor talking about us, you and me. It's not an actual city, it's us, all right? And, and, and that's not a New Testament revelation. This was written in the book of Psalm, thousand, well over a thousand years before it was written in the book of Revelation. Are you see what I'm saying to you? So I just think that that's, that's pretty important. There is a river. Its streams delight the people of God, you could say. The holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations might rage and kingdoms topple. The earth melts when he lifts up his voice. The Lord of hosts is with us, though, Right? This might be happening to the rest of the world, but he's with us, right? The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Think about this. Come, see the works of the Lord, who brings devastation on the earth. Now, that may not sound consistent with the next words, but we're going to explain some, we're going to, I'll help explain it to you. Come, see the works of the Lord, who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease. Well, wait a minute. If wars are ceasing, ceasing, then what's the devastation coming from? I'll address that in a minute. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears into pieces. He burns up the chariots. Are you seeing references to what we sang tonight? Yeah? Stop your fighting, he says. <laughs> and know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Think about this. Now, I'm not qualified to question the dating of this psalm. Um, the, the, portions, uh, the portions of it, to me, seem to lend itself to 
no better fit than the description of Ezekiel's temple, which itself was largely a foreshadowing of the kingdom of God during the millennial age, whether literal or metaphorical. I don't know whether that temple will ever actually be built or not, or whether it was always intended to be metaphorical. I don't know. Any more than the city that descends from heaven. We know for a fact that's not one that's literally built. That's you and I. It's very possible the temple was not literal either. But if you remember, and you're going to have to put on your your, your minds and to think back, because believe it or not, it was just a year ago we were in the book of Ezekiel. Um, but in the book of Ezekiel, if you remember, um, at Tor, uh, there was a time when God described in great detail the temple, the new temple that was going to be built. Now, this would have gotten the ear of everybody who heard the prophecy from Ezekiel um, if they had heard it. Now, a lot of them wouldn't have heard it because of the fact that there was a a requirement placed on the dissemination of this information, and that was when God had their hearts, which means it wasn't really disseminated because remember when the, the captivity was over and they were allowed to return, like a, just a smidgen of the people returned because they just, they lost interest during their captivity. And so it was never revealed as a prophecy per se to the people that was recorded prophetically to be read in future generations. But in the end of that prophecy, the description of the temple was was described. And uh, and this would have made sense to the children of Israel because going in, when they went into Babylon captivity, the Babylonians had destroyed the temple. You remember that, right? They destroyed the temple that was in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple. They had literally just leveled it to the ground practically. And uh, um, which is what God had said he, to Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah, uh, uh, or was it Jeremiah? I can't remember. Uh, he, he told King Hezekiah, because remember, King Hezekiah had had just got done bartering with the king of Assyria, like we brought up last week, to try to keep from being carried away captive like all of Northern Kingdom had been, and the outlying cities of Jerusalem and Judea, uh, uh, or Judah. And, uh, and but, but then the, the prophet came to him and told him, you know, set him straight, and he repented, and God delivered them from Shennacherib. But then right after that, you get these delegates coming down from Babylon and King Hezekiah in his pride shows them all the wealth of Israel, he even takes them to the temple and shows them all of uh, the splendor of God's temple. And the prophet comes and says, hey, who visited you? I mean, he knew who visited them. He just wanted to know it. He said, who came and visited you? Oh, delegates from Babylon. And he said, great, that's great. Um, uh, what, what did you show them? Oh, I showed him everything. I showed him all of the royal palace. I showed him my personal treasury. I even showed him the Lord's treasury in the temple. They saw it all. And the prophet said, because of this, the same uh, Babylon that you just showed all these things to will come and plunder your home and plunder the temple and carry away its treasures. And that's what happened after the death of Hezekiah that did happen. We know all that because we went all through that before we dealt with the years of silence that that happened. But Ezekiel was a prophet during that time period and God was giving him a plan for a temple. So the natural Jew, if they'd heard this, they thought, oh, this is a new plan to rebuild the temple that was just destroyed in Jerusalem that Solomon built. But it was really not a temple that God ever had built. And quite honestly, based on the topography of the land and the layout in the land and the uh, people who were reigning in different parts of the land, it would have been absolutely impossible to have built that temple at that time. It's possible that when Jesus comes back during the millennial reign, the temple might, might be built. I don't know. Um, at which point he can do what he wants with the land and make it possible both topologi uh, talk um, topologically and you know, with no rival nations encumbering the building of it because the size and scope of this thing was so huge, Jerusalem itself would have been, it, it would part of the temple would have been larger than the whole city of Jerusalem. So, I mean, it, it literally would have been impossible to build in this time period. Um, but I just want you to remember that this all that happened back then. The temple described by Ezekiel uh, was one that could, uh, that was impossible to build back then, but could be built in the future possibly. It is, however, in my opinion, that uh, the temple described is such in such detail to Ezekiel was not completely literal and would very likely be made a type of spiritual 
uh, made a type of spiritual sense to Ezekiel, who alone had seen uh, compared the comparative wonders of God's actual throne and visions. Remember, at the very beginning, he saw God, uh, God high and lifted up and all that, and he saw the cherubs and all that. Ezekiel saw all that. So he was in a unique position to understand the throne room of God and, 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 and so on. And if you remember, in which I know you probably don't recall the details, but in Ezekiel's temple, there were some things that were unique that were not consistent with any temple that had ever existed in Israel. Remember that the inner court, also known as the Tabernacle of Meeting, was for priests only, of which Ezekiel was a priest as well. In all of the real functional temples of the Old, Co Old Covenant, this area contained the showbread table, the menorah, and the altar of incense. Yet in the temple described to Ezekiel, while there was a temple, uh, a description of the altar of sacrifice just outside the tabernacle and an altar of incense referred to as a table that stands before the Lord in Ezekiel 41.21, there is no description of a showbread table or a menorah. Well, that, made, that makes it stand out with red flashing lights, right? More significantly than that, though, there is absolutely no description of the veil that separated the tabernacle of needing from the holiest of holy. Based on the description, it was wide open. There is no veil. That sounds a lot like what? Us and God under the new covenant. The temple veil was rent in two when Jesus cried out that it is finished, right? But up until that time, there was a veil separating humanity from the presence of God. But in this temple that was being described as Ezekiel, there was no veil. Okay? Not only that, there was no Ark of the Covenant in his temple. But that would make sense because the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of a physical location for God to place his name. But it was also a symbol of Israel's rebellion. Because remember, in the Ark of the Covenant were the three acts of rebellion. The manna. Then what else? The Ten Commandments, one of the first set, which was broken. And the last one would deal almost exactly with one of the things we dealt last week, though it wasn't Korah. What was it? It was Aaron's rod that budded. Because remember, separate from the sons of Korah who questioned Moses and Aaron's authority, at one point, Miriam and Aaron questioned Moses at their authority, and God had him stand before them and put the, the, the rod before the Lord, and whichever one budded, that was the one that was supposed, uh, you know, one was supposed to be the priest, the other one was the leader of the people of God, right? And so that was also laid up in the Ark of the Covenant, all three of them as a testimony against Israel because of the rebellion against God and his authority. And so that's been removed out of the way. Our rebellion has been moved, right? And the presence of God is no longer stuck in a box. It's inside of his people, amen? And so there, there's so many things in which this, this um, uh, Ezekiel's temple fits metaphorically what we're living in today. Now, this is almost certain proof of this temple being illustrative of the relationship Israel will have with God after the new covenant whether during the church age or more likely later during the millennial age. In this temple, there was a river which began at the threshold of the temple facing east, which ran from under the south side of the altar. It continued out of the temple complex heading east. So under, there was in this temple complex of, of, of um, Ezekiel, there was still an altar that represented the place where Jesus died. But, uh, but the water that flowed out from underneath the threshold of the temple went by and also flew out from, uh, flowed out from underneath the altar. So it'd be like the water that came out of Jesus' side, right? That has to, that which, to get together with his blood, served for the remission of our sins. Amen? This river was flowing out. It continued out of the temple complex heading east. Each third of a mile, the river getting deeper and deeper. If, uh, finally, Ezekiel, uh, in Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12, it tells us this. It says, water flows out to the eastern re region and goes down to Araba. When it enters the sea, the sea of foul water, the water of the sea becomes fresh. And there's a very large number of trees 
along both sides of the riverbank, providing all manner of food. The leaves on these trees will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. I hope the scriptures are popping up in your head. Each month they bear fresh fruit because the waters come from the sanctuary. The fruit will be used for food and the leaves for medicine. Now all of this sounds as if it's actually referring to the children of God as the new Jerusalem and the water flowing from the throne of God with its trees on either side producing 12 kinds of fruit whose leaves are for the healing of the nations, which is what you read in Revelation chapter 22 verse 1 and 2. So Revelation 22, verse 1 and 2, I believe is referring back to what Ezekiel was referring to when he's talking about this river that flowed out from the tabernacle and outside the side of the altar and ran straight out into the Dead Sea and made the Dead Sea fresh water. I mean, the, me the metaphors are just thick, right? You know, what was dead was made alive through the rivers flowing. So Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 and 2, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Water as clear as crystal pouring out from the throne of God or from the sanctuary of God and of the Lamb, flowing down the middle of the city's main street. Each On each side of the river um, is the tree of life producing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month of the year, and its leaves are for the healing of the nation. Sounds a lot like a further description of what Ezekiel was talking about. And I believe both of those is what he's talking about in this psalm, where it talks about there's a river that makes glad the city of God. Okay, are you with me? So uh, it's very... Uh, now, all that might fail on some level or another because of the fact that if, in fact, this is not written during the time period of Ezekiel, but prophetically, it could still be talking about the same thing, okay? Also, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it describes God's throne in heaven and says, Also, before the throne was something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal. In the middle and around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes front and back. So there's always this depiction of a river flowing out from the throne of God, okay? And uh, and uh, and in two prophecies that we have, at least in Scripture, they are tr the trees of life on either side. They bear fruit, fresh fruit every single um, uh, every single month, and the leaves are for the healing of the nation. Now, of course, at the beginning of the establishment of Jesus's earthly kingdom, a devastating war will ensue. Okay, now this is going back to the prophecy we just read, because remember it says in this prophecy it says. Come and see, verse 8, the works of the Lord who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars to cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears into pieces, and he burns up the chariots. Stop your fighting and know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted upon the earth. Now, so that statement right there, I think, is, is essentially saying is referring to, I believe, when Jesus comes and sets up his millennial kingdom. Because when Jesus comes to set up his millennial kingdom, who's coming with him? Who can tell me? We are. Very good. Because we've already been, we've been having seven years in heaven at the wedding feast of the Lamb, right? And the earth has just been doing its thing with devastation and destruction. And the, and the beast and the false prophet are still alive on the earth when we come down. And the first thing we do is make war with the beast and the false prophet. And when we destroy them, then a strong armed angel takes Satan and cast him into the abyss to be and locks the door behind him for a thousand years. And Jesus establishes his kingdom. So before we hammer our pruning, uh, our, 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 our spears into pruning hooks and stuff like that and, got, and war ceases, it starts with a war, doesn't it? God's going to bring devastation to the earth, but then he's going to say, no more wars. Stop it. <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, and so I really believe that's probably what this is referring to in the psalm. Jesus will end, uh, now, now that, that the cessation of war will end after Satan is released, after that thousand year reign, and he's going to stir up the kings of the north to come and attack Jesus before they ever get to the city. The breath of God is going to destroy them. So really, you really can't call it a war because they're dead before they can even do much. So war will have ceased. Amen. And I think that's what prophetically this psalm is referring to. A lot of these psalms refer to have a dual purpose of dealing with what's going on with Israel at the time the psalm was written and the hope of what God was going to do with Israel in the future. 
I am not claiming that the writers and the composers of these songs always understood that the future God promised to to Israel through Abraham was not going to be seen until a thousand until you know year thousands of years after Messiah came and left. I don't think they had that understanding. They just knew God made a promise; He's going to make it happen. And so they're referring to when Messiah comes and sets up His rule on the earth. That's what they're thinking, right? And remember, the Jews didn't really have an understanding of a time of the Gentiles. So they thought when Messiah came the first time, that's what was going to happen, right? So I'm not claiming that the psalmist knew the time period. That for all, it's very possible that in their mind, if they were in a Syrian captivity or if they're in a Babylonian captivity, they might have been thinking, this might be it. This might be it. This uh, By the end of this captivity, it could be that Messiah comes and delivers us and set, sets up his kingdom here on earth and Jerusalem will be the seat of power on the whole planet. That might, They were probably thinking that, you know. They were wrong, but they were just basing it off of what revelation they did have, right? Just like we do. You know, there's a lot of things we probably get wrong because we have, we see in part, right? So, but nonetheless, most of these Psalms are in reference to the future millennial kingdom, though they didn't see it as a future millennial kingdom that I was going to come when Messiah came, and something to address the distress that they were in when they were in uh, persecution from other nations or being carried off into exile to other nations. So now, Psalm chapter 47, starting verse uh, 1, we're going to re just read... Um, it's starting in verse 1, but I want, I want to tell you something first. In similar fashion... But in a different approach and focus, this Psalm 47 and 48 address God's national promise to Israel through Abraham to rule the entire earth. At just about the middle of this Psalm 47 in verse 5 is a type of procession for God to ascend to his throne in the midst of the shouts of his people and the sound of the trumpet. Okay, so that's what both this Psalm 47 and 48 are essentially talking about the coronation of God ascending the throne. Okay, so starting in verse 1, chapter 47, starting in verse 1, for the choir director, Psalm of the Sons of, the Sons of Korah, clap your hands, all you people, and shout to God with a voice of triumph. We're familiar with this, aren't we? He says, for the Lord Most High is awe-inspiring, a great king over Jerusalem. No, 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 I'm sorry, o -o over over. Greater Judea. No, 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 no. Oh, 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 over all of Israel. No, no. Over the whole earth. Well, when has God claimed to be, uh, to establish his kingship over the whole earth? Well, in the millennial reign, right? So you can see why I'm assuming that's what it's talking about. It's okay. He says, For the Lord Most High is awe inspiring, a great king over all the earth. He subdues people under us, Israelites. And nations under our Jewish feet, right? I'm adding words so you know what he's talking about. He chooses us for his inheritance. The pride of Jacob whom he loves. Think about this. God ascends amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounds of the trumpet. Can you see why it was a big deal when the gospel was eventually taken from the Jews and they turned to the Gentiles that questions arose thinking, is God replacing the Jews with us? Well, that's a valid question. Is somebody with me? And those questions were being put before Paul. And Paul said, God hasn't forsaken the Jews. He says, he had God has set them aside for the time being until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. But he says, God has not forsaken his people. He will fulfill the promise he made to the forefathers. So what we're reading here, I mean, Paul was very, he remembered these Psalms. And he said, God forbid that he would break his word to Israel. Just because Israel's rejected their Messiah doesn't mean God's going to break his word to Israel. Right? Amen? So, I mean, so, you know, when we read Psalms like this, I think sometimes it's good to think back on what was in Paul's mind when he's writing back to the Gentiles and said, are you kidding me? Of course he hasn't set aside the Jews. He's still got a lot of promises to keep to them. Amen? And he's thinking about things like this. God ascends through, uh, amid shouts of joy. The Lord 
among them at the, the sounds of the trumpet. Sing praise to God, sing praise. Sing praise to our God, sing praise. The beautiful thing about this, guys, is that you and I are going to have front row seats at this. Because we're going to be the ones writing down to make war with the beast of the false prophet and to help him set this up. We're going to be in the march for the coronation of the Lord Jesus to ascend the throne. We're going to be there. <laughs> we're going to be singing the shouts, maybe playing a trumpet, but we're going to be part of this. This, Do you realize this psalm is as much talking about you as it is about the king? He says here, sing praises to God. He's not saying God sing to yourself. Who's he referring to? The people of God. Well, I'm a people of God. How about you? And I'm going to be there. So he says here, sing praise to God, sing praise, sing praise to our king, sing praise, sing a song of instruction, for God is king, again, of all the earth. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The the nobles of the people have assembled with the people of the God of Abraham, for the leaders of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Again, that last verse right there. Now, you, there's a way in which you could claim the psalm fits any time period because God literally owns the whole earth, doesn't he? But he really isn't king of the earth. Remember, the Bible says his kingdom is not of this world. So he's not king of this earth right now. Does he own it? Oh, you bet he does. Absolutely he does. Is he sovereign over it? Yes, he is. Is he the one who establishes who's in authority on the earth? Yes, he does. But he is not king. And the reason why is in order to have to have a king, you have to have subjects. So he's a king over his spiritual kingdom, and that includes you and I. And we are supposed to be doing commerce while he's gone until he returns. Amen? to spread his kingdom and his rule and his reign in the hearts of free will people in, or in the hearts of those of goodwill, like the angel said at the birth of Jesus, right? Good news, right? To those who are of goodwill, right? If you'll bow the knee to the king, your king has come. Good news, right? But there's a day coming when he's going to rule the whole earth. And we do know the Bible talks about the fact that during that time period, it says, People and nations and kings are going to come from far and wide and come to the Jewish people in Jerusalem and say, teach us the ways of your God. Because they're foreign to them. They don't know God. They don't know his ways. And the Jewish people will be in the privileged position of teaching the other nations the ways of God. They're going to, and what does it say right here? The nobles of the people have assembled with the people of the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, for the leaders of the earth belong to God and he is greatly exalted. Amen. So you can see how this fits. Going on now to Psalm 48, starting in verse one, a song, a song, a, a psalm of the song, uh, sons of Korah. The Lord is great and is highly praised in the city of our God on his holy mountain. Rising splendidly is the joy of the whole earth. Mount Zion on the slopes of the north is the city of the great king. And again, you may or may not remember that, but during the time that we're going through the book of Ezekiel, it talked about the city that was going to be on the side of the mountain. It's referring to the same thing, okay? Mount Zion on the slopes of the north is the city of the great king. God is known as a stronghold in its citadels. Look, the kings assembled. They advanced together. They looked and froze it with fear. They fled in terror. Trembling seized them there. Agony like that of a woman in labor. As you, uh, as you wrecked the ships of Tarshish with the east wind. Now, you, I, I don't want to get into a lot of this, but that would refer to... Um, tre- Essentially, trade and the power that comes through trade, economic wealth, okay? You wreck the ships of Tarshish with the, the east wind. Just as we heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Think about this. God, within your temple, we contemplate your faithful love. Your name, God, like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with justice, meaning Jesus, who's the right hand of God, is filled with justice. Mount Zion is glad. That's you and I. 
Mount Zion is glad. The towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Go around Zion, encircle it, count its towers, note its ramparts, tour its citadels, so that you can tell a future generation, this is God, our God forever and ever. He will lead us eternally. Short psalm, but has a lot of meaning. So we're going to wrap up tonight with Psalm 49. This last psalm we are covering tonight is a very practical psalm, which instructs God's people to not follow the wicked in their temporal pursuits. Uh, We see words in this psalm which offer a strikingly clear window into the teachings and the promises of the new covenant. And I want to see if you can identify some of them as we read. It says, verse 1, For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, Hear this, all ye people. Listen, all you who inhabit the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth speaks wisdom. My heart, my heart's meditation brings understanding. I turn my ear to a proverb. I explain my riddle with a liar. Why should I fear in times of trouble? The iniquity of my foes surrounds me. They trust in wealth and they boast in their abundant riches. Yet these can't redeem a person or pay his ransom before God, since the price of redeeming him is too costly. One should forever stop even trying, so that he may live forever and not see the pit. For one can see that wise men die. The foolish and the senseless also pass away. Then they leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their eternal homes, and their homes from generation to generation though they have have named estates after themselves. But despite his assets, man will not last. He is like the animals that perish. This is the way of those who are arrogant and of their followers who approve of their words. Think about this. Like sheep, they are headed for Sheol. Death will shepherd them. The upright will rule over them in the morning and their form will waste away in the grave, far from their lofty abode. For God will redeem my life from the power of the grave, for he will take me. Salah, or think about this. Do not be afraid when a man gets, uh, yeah, don't, do not be afraid when a man gets rich, when the wealth of his house increases, for when he dies, he will take nothing at all. His wealth will not follow him down. Though he praises himself during his lifetime, the people will praise you when you do well for yourself. He will go to the generation of his fathers. They will never see the light. A man with valuable possessions but without understanding is like the animals that perish. Now, here we see a future promise, several future future promises that are very, very indicative of the new covenant uh, um, and the promises that we have in the New Covenant. Who can point some of them out in this psalm? I'm sorry, would you say that again? The psalm says some things that are consistent with the New Covenant and its promises, but are not really consistent with the Old Covenant under which it was written. What are those things? Can you point out a few of them to me? If you can't, it's not the end of the world. I just want to give you a chance. I'm not sure I'm really comprehending the question. I'm sorry. That's all right. This psalm has some things that it says that are consistent with life under the new covenant and its promises and are not consistent with the old covenant and its promises. I'm wondering if you can see some of them. Uh, I'm thinking in verse 3. Okay. My mouth shall speak of wisdom and meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Okay. That is something they could have done under the old covenant, but it's definitely a new covenant thing without question. Absolutely. All right, let's look at this. Yeah, I, I, That's I, all right. I, I, this is, I didn't do it to put people on the spot and make you feel bad. 
I, I just uh, just want to see if you saw it. Okay, it says uh, it's starting verse well, thirteen. I don't know how long I'm, gonna see you, so I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> verse thirteen. Let's see. Start reading there. It says, "This is the way those who are arrogant, and of their followers who approve of their words, like sheep, they are headed for the grave. Death will shepherd them. The upright will rule over them." So when death shepherds the ungodly, it's you and I, the upright, who will be the ones ruling over them. We're not ruling over them now, but we will rule over them during the millennial kingdom and very likely over throughout eternity. It says, but God will redeem my life from the power of the grave. That's not an Old Testament promise. That's not an Old Covenant promise. You don't see that until the new covenant, right? What did Paul say? He says, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your power? You carry no power over me. I'm a child of God. I've been redeemed from the power of the grave. Yes or no? Do you guys remember this? This is new. You remember the new covenant says the grave has no more power over us. Death has no more sting for us, right? Because we are no longer subject to death as the rest of this world is. Now, surely our bodies may die unless we are partaking the rapture, which case our body won't die. But yeah, we might die before if we die. We will definitely die if we die if um, if we pass away before the Lord's return. But that's the only way in which it has any power of us because at, when Jesus returns, the grave has got to release our bodies, and our bodies become glorified, take on immortality, and join us in the air. The grave has got no final word concerning us. Amen. So that's new covenant, isn't it? That's not old covenant. That's new covenant. They had no thought of that under the old covenant. Now they thought, many of them thought, well, you know, well, I will go and I'll be with God. But I don't know any place under the old covenant where their thought was that my body will join me in a glorified body. They just figured, well, my spirit's just going to go to God. And I'll just kind of be like a disembodied spirit floating around with God forever. But the idea that the grave has no power over us anymore is not an Old Testament concept. Okay, this is New Covenant, New Covenant promise. Okay, anyway, it's just an interesting little thing. I just thought I'd throw it out there because, again, it indicated that this is prophetic. He was not speaking from the covenant he was under. He's referring to something that was far in the future, right? God's people have been delivered from the power of death and the power of the grave, regardless of the wealth they possess in this life. In the end, the righteous will rule over the unrighteous. And in that way, this this, this psalm is a clear depiction of life under the new covenant, right? So, all right. Does anybody have any any questions or thoughts or uh, further about what we've uh, covered tonight? I had one, and it goes back when you mentioned um, the river. Yeah. That's the river of life, I assume. Sure. I would imagine, yeah. And it flows from God's throne. Yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And it it makes the waters turn fresh. Yeah, so which is a metaphor. Gets, okay. Oh, okay. So there really is a dead sea. There really is a dead sea. Yes, absolutely. The, the, thus, he was referencing it. Not be. Well, I'm sure there will be. Won't, but it won't be dead anymore. Nothing will be dead in the new kingdom. Absolutely. But uh, yes, absolutely. But I mean, it's 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 very much akin to um, again Ezekiel when he saw the Valley of Dry Bones. And he said, you know, and God asked him, he said, can these bones live once more? And he said, you alone know, Lord. And he said, well, call, prophesy, son of man, and call to the north, the south, the east, and the west for the winds to blow on this these bones that they might live. And so he called upon them, and they blew upon the bones, and the bones began to take on sinew and mu- muscle and, and tendons and ligaments and flesh. And the, 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 the Valley of Bones stood before him, a great army. And that was all talking about the new birth. It's like it's 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 significant that the way that the first people who ever got born again got born again was by Jesus breathing on them, right? And they the dead came alive, that's right? Not a metaphor, that's, that's not a metaphor. That's real, but that's a way in which the Valley of Dry Bones was literally fulfilled because the dead men they were dead men, spiritually dead. Even his disciples were spiritually dead, but he, when he breathed on them and he said, receive the Spirit of God, they came alive, right? By the breath of God. 
uh, which is what the prophet was being told to to cause to blow on them. So, but in the same way that the dead came to life there, the Dead Sea comes to becomes fresh by the flowing of this river of life. It's it's a metaphor it's saying essentially the same thing though. What was dead comes to life. Okay. Uh, I have a second question. Sure. At the end of uh, the millennial reign, mm -hmm. Satan is released for, usually... for a short time. What's it going to look like? Well, oh, I don't know. Will be people that will be, um, what do I want to say, uh, subject to his evil? There will, people, there will be people that follow him, absolutely. But they will be people who all this time will have harbored resentment in their heart against Jesus ruling. Because when Jesus reigns, he's going to reign with a rod of iron. Which means he's going to, there's not going to be a choice. You will do what is right. Period. During his rule and reign. Um, kind of like today. Only in reality. Like today, if you break a law, if you know the right people and have the right amount of money, you can get out of it. But if justice were really to be done, if you broke a law, you'd be doing time, right? Or, so, or you'd receive whatever punishment is, is dictated by our, law, our laws. Well, when Jesus rules and reigns, the same thing will happen. If you break the law of being kind to your neighbor, there will be recompense for that. You will be punished. Right. I mean, everything that makes a person godly that stands up to the character of God will be a matter of judicious issue at that time. So you can imagine people that are truly ungodly are going to chafe against this. They're not going to want to give to the poor. They're not want to be kind to their neighbor. They're not going to want to be honest with if there are taxes, taxes. They're, they're going to they're going to want to cheat and, and exploit and murder and steal just like they always have. But now they can't get away with it. And they're going to be chafing under this. When Satan is released, it says that he's going to stir up Gog and Magog, kings of the north. We don't know who it is, so it doesn't make any difference trying to figure it out. But kings of the north, the north could be literal, geographical, it could be metaphorical, I don't know. Just knows that he's going to stir up the kings of the north, and they're going to come down, and they're going to try to make war with Jesus. The Son of God, sitting on a literal physical throne. But when they come up to try to do so, it says the breath of God is going to destroy them. And that will be the end. That's not Armageddon. No, 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 no. no. See, the Bi see th this is what you run into with the danger of Hollywood getting a hold of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know Jack from Applesauce what they're talking about, and so they blend things. They blend things between the seven years of the tribulation with the end of the actual world, and they're not the same thing at all. I mean, the seven years of the Great Tribulation, when the when uh, the Prince of Darkness is is manifest in the physical body through the Antichrist and the Beast and the False Prophet are here. That's not the end of the world. You still got a thousand years before the end of the world, right? They've only got and and they're only doing bad and judgment's only coming on the earth for only three and a half of those seven years. It's not like a millennial. It's a very short period of time, right? And at the end of that is when Satan is locked up. And he's locked up for a thousand years, during which time Jesus will reign from the throne of David from Jerusalem, and uh, and the earth will be his footstool, literally. And uh, um, at the end of that time, like I said, Satan is released for a short period of time. The 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 kings of Gog, Gog and Magog come down to try to make war with Jesus, and it doesn't go well. They die instantly by the breath of God, and uh, um, and at that point is when God judges all of the nations. Everybody leaves the earth. And the just will stand before uh, before God at the judgment seat of Christ, and the unjust will stand before the great white throne judgment. The, anybody at the great white throne judgment is going to spend eternity in hell. That's their future, period. If you show up there, it's already done deal. You've already, you've already got the judgment. You just haven't been pronounced it yet, okay? If you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you're already saved because Christ's already been judged for you, thus the name, right? You and I will already be in glorified bodies. None of this affects us at all because we've already been judged, right? Um, at that point, no one, be, no one will be on the planet and God will renovate the earth by fire. There will be a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And that's when the prophet uh, was told by the, by, uh, um, by the uh, um, John was told by the angel, look and I'll show you the bride. And we were descending from heaven down to the earth. It's after it's been renovated. 
That is when eternity starts. Okay? So that's what that looks like. Uh, there's going to be a billion details in there that we don't know, but that's the general broad strokes that God has chosen to tell us. And that is the end of rebellion. That's the end, period. Yeah. There is no more rebellion. There is. The judgment then doesn't come until after the thousand years of Jesus. That's right. That's when everything is judged. That's right. Now, I mean, people that die during that time period would have their own individual judgment, but the great judgment of everybody on the earth at the time, that takes place at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. That's right. And that's when he renovates the earth by fire and there's new heavens and a new earth. So, and... Why, why is Satan released? <laughs> it's, it's a judicial matter, I can tell you that. I don't understand all that there is in, uh, to it other than the fact that Jesus has had a chance to rule for a thousand years unchallenged. And what happens if you release the opposition to influence man? What will be their response? And, uh, um, you know, whatever God does, he does to be honest, just, and fair. Because as soon as this is over, they're going to be judged. And in order for there to be the judgment to have jurisprudence to, and to be um, equitable, there has to be a basis for the judgment. And so I don't exactly know what that does, but I can tell you what plays part in it. Otherwise, God wouldn't do it. Um, so clearly he must, he's must he got to allow him to do it. And it actually uses that terminology. He must let him release for a short period of time. I don't know why he must, but you can guarantee it has something to do with justice. Because God's just. Even to the enemy. He's second just. Chance. What's that? Second chance. Well, it's not a second chance for him, no. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. I imagine. I mean, his his power that he has has always just been influence. Right. You know, uh, so, uh, and, and, and the Bible says that Gog and Magog rising up against Jesus, God is the one that puts it in their heart to do that. It's just that the enemy goes there to stir it up. Okay? Um, and they, they come down and they they try to, you know, declare war against him and it, and it fails epically. And that's the end. So, I mean, again, there might be a million smaller stories that take place in the middle of all that. I don't know. And there, it's possible that maybe the Bible might address those in some hidden nooks and cranny in the Old Testament, and I'm just not aware of it, but that's what I know. Um, so that's that's it. That's all there is. When Christ comes down and we meet him, mm -hmm. and then there's a thousand years, are we on well, earth? Yes, but the, you're kind of blending two things. When he comes to get us, he's not going to come physically on the earth. He's going to be in the air, and we will join him in the air. That's when God turns his attention from judging his church to judging the world. And at that point, that's when, you know, all hell breaks loose. That's when the, 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 um, the Antichrist raises to power. We will already know who the Antichrist is before we leave. But um, but he won't really be doing much until after we leave. There will be a pseudo peace that he will establish between the Jewish people and the Arabs or the, uh, the descendants of Ishmael for a period of three and a half years. And about three and a half years into it, he's going to betray the Jewish nation in that treaty. And that's when judgment comes. And that's when you hear about, you know, mountains falling and things turning to blood and all that. I mean, that's when the great tribulation is those last three and a half years. And it's at the end of those last three and a half years, that's when you and I come down here with Jesus and he comes down on the Mount of Olives, okay? This is when he's touching feet on terra firma. The first time he didn't even touch the earth, he came to pick us up in the air. Second time he touches down and we will be with him. And we're riding down there to make war with the beast and the false prophet and to destroy them and to set up his kingdom. So yes, we will be with him. And during that time period, you and I will be given based on how we responded to his lordship during this time period of our life, we will be given and delegated a certain amount of ruling authority on the earth to rule and reign with him. Some people might be ruling over a couple of houses and another person might be ruling over a nation based on how they allowed and lived the lordship of Jesus Christ in this life. Um, that's how we will be rewarded. But uh, um, that's the time period when that's going to happen. Is that the people that, are, that live through the tribula 
Well, well, they would be included if they died. Yeah, if they died, then. If they didn't die, they will still be alive when we establish the kingdom here on earth. Yeah. Like God's not going to kill everybody because if he did, there'd be no one to rule and reign over. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah. I mean, there will be a lot of people that will have died during the tribulation. But, you know, not everyone. And uh, and when we when when we come down with Jesus and He sits down on the on the Mount of Olives, says right then over 144,000 Jews are going to come to Christ at that very moment. That's when the the passage in I always forget whether it's Zephaniah or Zechariah is fulfilled when they look at Jesus is that they'll look on Him whom they pierced and they will say, "Where did you receive these wounds?" And He's going to say, "These are the wounds that I received when I was in the house of my friends." And it says Israel will weep for him as a father or mother weeps for their child who has passed. The 144,000 will, they'll repent. Thank you, Jesus. The Jews will repent and they will recognize their Messiah. And they will be the conduit. Thank you, Jesus, through which the knowledge of God is disseminated through the whole earth. And the prophecy of the Old Testament is fulfilled where it says, the knowledge of the glory of God will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. And that will be done through the Jewish nation. Because Jesus will rule from the throne of David in Jerusalem. And the people of David, the descendants of uh, the Jewish, actual physically born Jewish descendants, will receive the promise that had been promised to Abraham in their land. And all the kings of the earth will come and ask us, teach us the ways of your God which is really good advice, good thing to do because Jesus is ruling. He's not only the God of Israel, he's the God of the earth. It just happens to be that Israel is the kingdom from which he reigns. So Israel is the center of the earth at that point. I mean, not literal right. geographically, but um, a political power, it's the throne of the earth. And so the kings are going to come all of a sudden and Jews are going to be pretty, pretty important. And they're not going to be persecuting them anymore. They're going to be asking for advice. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yes, uh huh. With the threat of what's going on in the Middle East now, mm -hmm. and with the threat of nuclear and Iran mm -hmm. wanting to wipe Israel off the map. Mm -hmm. Well, they're well, not going to nuke it because if they do, they're going to kill themselves. Uh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, they're kind of close. Well, the other people, yeah, they're very, they're they're super close. <laughs> But, in other words, Jerusalem will not be destroyed. The physical land, geog geographically, might change, but the dirt will still be there, you know. I mean, God is still going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, so the physical property will be there, whether there's going to be buildings like we see today still there or not, how much of it will be destroyed during the tribulation, I don't know, because, I mean, we're going to have you know, what amounts to asteroids falling to the earth and, and doing tremendous amounts of damage during that time period. So a lot of the land's going to be destroyed. So, I mean, even if it doesn't happen now, it'll happen then. It, but it doesn't matter. When Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom, he, he knows how to build cities. So not a problem. <laughs> right? So, uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, we have to keep in mind, bear in mind that every Jew from every tribe is not living in... Israel right now. They're all over the world. So, I mean, even if you wiped out the Jewish people that were in Jerusalem, you haven't destroyed Israel. You, you, you've destroyed a physical place we call Israel, but Israel is the people. And that's the land they will, not they are to, they will inherit, right? But they're not going to inherit till the millennial reign. And there's not a, a Palestinian alive that could do the first thing about it, because he's given it to them, right? And you and I will be writing down with them and we're going to see too that happens. So uh, what's going on now has got nothing to do with what's going to happen. Does, does that? Yeah, it's got nothing to do with it. This is all the this is just all the devil just uproaring things and causing trouble and and causing Christians to doubt, causing Israel to doubt, making and and you know if we read the scriptures and keep them in their dates and in order, we understand that it doesn't matter if all of Israel was leveled. There's still Jews on the planet. And God knows who they are and he knows what tribe they come from. And when the time is necessary, he's going to bring those people back to their homeland. And he's going to establish his kingdom from there. 
If it's just a grease spot when he shows up, well, then he'll build it from the ground up. It doesn't matter. We're not told. You know? So, um, you know, I don't believe it probably will be. But, you know, it doesn't, in the end, it doesn't matter to us. Who cares? Because uh, God will establish his kingdom right there. You know, I, uh, well, I actually wanted a book. Uh, it's called Shepherds for Sale. Have you ever heard of it? Mm -mm. But it, it talks about uh, the infiltration, infiltration of the church mm -hmm. by um, non-Christians, atheists. Mm-hmm. All the people on the left type mm -hmm. persons. Okay. Um, actually, just compared. By infiltration, what does it mean? Influence. Okay. Um, mainly through the pastors, which then mm -hmm. feed their flock. Okay. Misinformation. Okay. The word. Yeah. It's going to be a hard read. I just barely started it. Okay. But it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I, I like the particular terminology that is being used because I think it can lead us to a thinking that's not accurate. But we do know the Bible is very clear that the end won't come until the great falling away, takes, the great apostasy takes place first. And we're living in it right now. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it's in that case, it's really not infiltrating the church. It's, it's just drawing away people whose hearts were already not devoted to him anyway. Uh, as far as the church, the church still stands triumphant. Um, that's got nothing to do with us. It, it, it reminds me, you know, I, I don't like the analogy, but it is still a good analogy. It's, it's very much, and we grazed on it last week, I think. It's another way, another analogy yet still. And that is what COVID did with the churches. You know, when, when people were told not to show up, and, uh, and they closed down churches and so on. And whether that's legal or not is a not issue. That's not the issue. The issue uh, is that once they had been out of a church for X number of months or years, um, year and a half or whatever, uh, when churches were able to open up again, a lot of those people just didn't come back. And, and in my heart, I'm thinking, that's awesome. Churches are thinking that's the worst thing that could ever happen. Oh my gosh, we lost so many people. I'm thinking, you didn't lose anything but dead weight. Because if, if their heart was really for the Lord, this would have made no difference. All you did was purify who does show up. That's great. That didn't affect the church at all. All it did was just get rid of something that needed to leave in the freaking first place. Right? That's all it did. And... That's exactly what's happening with uh, the great apostasy. Those who leave, it's really not, it's not affecting the real church. It might affect the numbers in the gatherings, but it doesn't affect the real church, you know? Um, I mean, it does in one respect in that those that you can't commit apostasy if you're not in the church, if you're not part of the body of Christ. But the bottom line is God is hastening this. He, he's shaking it. He's, he, all that's going to shake is going to shake. So that what we, we we inherit is a kingdom that cannot be shaken, right? So far from God saying, oh gosh, I better be careful. I don't want to break any eggs here. God's here doing this number to the carton of eggs, you know? Whatever, let's just hasten it and get it done. Whatever's going to break, let it break, right? And whatever's going to stand, let it stand. Because uh, judgment begins in the house of God. And whoever is still standing at the end, they're his. And it's not that he wanted the other people to leave, but and he didn't, but he didn't make them leave. Because if your heart is really his, nothing can make you leave. Right? Amen. So bring it on. Bring on the persecution, bring on the infiltration, whatever you want to call it. Fine. All you're doing is just helping. The enemy doesn't even realize that his attacks are actually helping God purify his bride. Because he's too stupid to know that. He can hear me saying that right now, and he's still too stupid to not do it. He will do everything, because he thinks he's hurting the church. He's not hurting the church. Not the real church. Right? So let him do what he wants to do. Well, again, you see how free we are? What do I care? I don't care. I mean, I, I love those people, but if they're going to be, if they're going to spit in the face of my son, Messiah, I just assume they leave anyway. I'll open the door for you. I'll start your car. 
please don't come back. You know, I'm fine with that. I don't want them to be lost, but I don't want them here either. You know what I mean? So uh, I'd much rather them stay and, 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 and get their hearts grounded in Christ and be committed to him. But if they're not going to do that, then just go ahead and don't wait. Just leave now. Right? Just do it. So uh, all the people that are, 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 what do they call that now, Terry? They got this term for it. I forget what it is. All these people that are, are, are um, shoot, they're, called, they're leaving the faith, but I forget what they call it. Oh, deconstructing. They're deconstructing their faith. <laughs> they're trying to make it sound so intellectual. Essentially, they're becoming idiots. And they're missing the point of what scripture actually says, taking some things hyper-literally and not taking seriously some things that the Bible was very clear about. And they walk away from the faith because in their mind it didn't make sense. Or in their mind it doesn't look like it works. Or in their mind that doesn't look like love. And so they're de by deconstructing their faith, that means they're trying, they are siphoning what the scriptures say through their intellect. And when they see something that doesn't make sense, they criminalize the scripture and say, therefore, I can't really believe any of this. I'm glad I caught this now. I need to walk away from this Christian thing. I'll just pursue God for who he really is. Clearly, that book can't be trusted. That's what deconstructing your faith is. And there are thousands of people doing that right now. And that's fine. Let them do it. Please, speed up. Do it quickly. I'm not against that at all. So, uh, so approach the book with that mentality. Because this is just hastening. I mean, this is God judging his pride. And judgment for you and I is good. It purifies my heart to God and it gets rid of things that don't belong to him. Well, then bring it on. I'm all for it. Amen. So the crucible can't hurt us. Amen. <laughs> Great. Grace. Grace. Grace.